Hey everyone, Genome here, coming at you with the next uh, episode in my interview series. This is the series where I take a look at people who do interesting and or extraordinary things. Well, those of you who are purveyors of my channel know that as of late, I have been reviewing the Friday the 13th series. I've gone through all of them. Uh, links below somewhere, you'll find them there, but it's basically a month of my life was uh, <laughs> sitting in the editing chair trying to uh, make things interesting. But anyway, I've been gathering uh, actors, actresses, and most especially directors of said movies, and I have the distinct pleasure tonight to be joined with the director of Jason Goes to Hell. I've been looking forward to this. Uh, chronologically speaking, Friday 13th, Part 9, uh, Mr. Adam Marcus. Adam, how are you doing this evening? I'm really good, man. I'm really good. How are you? Doing. Oh, I'm I'm swell. I'm Danny. We we've been working on this uh, for about two, what two or three months, <laughs> trying to get times coordinated and all that. So, wow. Yeah, it's wow. It's something sure. sometimes. But you know, we're all busy people. So yep. uh, I really want once again thank Absolutely. you for taking the time to sit down with us today. So my pleasure. Let's make it a fun. My one. absolute pleasure. Absolutely. All righty. So um, all right. So you're a man of many hats: a director, writer, producer, and more. Um, so why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about Adam Marcus? The person. Wow. Uh, Easy questions uh, from, to start. From, absolutely. Uh, it's loaded. From from what perspective? From uh, the perspective of my career? Of uh, I mean, you. you uh, it's it's a broad question. Oh yeah, it is. Let's just do. Uh, we're talking Mississippi broad here. Now let's start uh, early, uh, maybe formative years. What was uh, what was at young sure. Adam Marcus like uh, up till about high school, and then we'll segue into the other things. Cool. No, that's no, that's not bad. That's not bad. So, uh, look, I, you know, I was I was very blessed in that, um, you know, I, I was born in Manhattan. Uh, my parents moved to Connecticut uh, when I was a baby still, uh, and then when they split, I got the best of both worlds because like this incredible Manhattan education and this magnificent education in a little town called Westport, Connecticut, um, and that was uh, pretty extraordinary stuff uh, because. The, the the let's say the high school I went to was built around a pre-existing theater, mm -hmm. uh, so there was already a theater there that was a working theater that was making a ton of money and and uh, Doors played there, Janis Joplin, Jimi Hendrix. Um, I mean, it was like an amazing place. And then in the in the seventies they built a theater around it, and then I went there in the eighties. Um, and so, but when I was when I was a kid, when I was really a little kid, uh, my best friend was a guy named Noel Cunningham. Uh, was a great dude, and his father happened to be Sean S. Cunningham, who was, uh, <laughs> when I was 10 years old, was making a movie called Friday the 13th. What? And um, anyway, uh, I was, I was you know, kind of underfoot the, uh, the entire time they were making that film, and then others, Spring Break, House, you know, at all. And uh, you know, I was sort of Noel's um, best friend, but also I was Noel's most kind of responsible friend. So I was always allowed, Noel would get in trouble with everybody else, he would get in trouble with me. <laughs> so his parents liked having me around. Um, I think they thought I was a good influence. I don't, I don't know if that was true. But, uh, but anyway, um, I, I love movie making. I love film. My whole family was in business, mostly as actors, um, a lot of Broadway performers in that group. Um, and uh, in fact, my uncle Ned, who is who's sort of a that guy, he's like on every sixth Law and Order. There he is. Uh, but he, um, you know, aside from being on Broadway every year and doing all this television and film, uh, he was one of the leads of the first uh, Weinstein Brothers movie, the first Miramax film, The Burning. Um, he plays Eddie in the movie, who who gets killed on the raft in the in the that big uh, you know late second act turn. Um, and my uncle Joe Ellison. Uh, wrote and directed Don't Go in the House, the classic uh, 1980 uh, kind of slasher pyromaniac movie. So I was steeped with all this kind of stuff around me, and then there was Shunningham and Friday the 13th. So uh, I, I was a big theater kid, uh, spent a lot of time in the theater and, and creating my own uh, company. By the time I was 15, I had created my own theater company, and I had also uh, started to teach acting um, since I had been an actor since I was a small child. And uh, my theater company was wildly successful, so much so that it helped to pay my way through NYU Film School, where I went uh, several years later, uh, and I won Best Picture at NYU. Uh, in fact, my theater company paid for all my student filmmaking there. It was kind of incredible, actually. So uh, I left 
New York University with Best Picture and Debt Free um, because I'd been running this company. I, I, I did over 80 shows uh, until the, uh, once I was 21. Uh, I had just finished my 81st show. So, um, you know, it, it was a very, I, I had a wonderful childhood that was full of insane amounts of creativity uh, that flat out led me to a career in filmmaking. Um, and, and again, look, I think most of the guys my age, they have, you know, a story similar to this is that, you know, I'm nine years old, I'm sitting in the theater on the second day on a Saturday morning, first matinee screening with my dad, who had already seen the film in New York the night before at the, at the premiere. Uh, drove to Connecticut, took my brother and I out to see Star Wars. And uh, I sat there and watched uh, the Imperial Cruiser uh, go over my head. And uh, as I saw that Star Destroyer, I just was like, you know. <sighs> and I turned to my dad and I went, <laughs> I want to do that. And I didn't want to be a spaceman. I didn't want to be an astronaut. I wanted to be the guy who made a movie like that. And so for me, my whole life has been a singular uh, fascination with, um, with film and with storytelling. And so that's been, uh, yeah, that's been, that's been the journey thus far. And, uh, you know, so it led me to NYU and then, uh, and then on. So you had a, the acting bug and the directing bug and basically the whole theater bug hit you very early, but it looks like your formative years were surrounded by that kind of activity, so it's a little surprise there, right? Absolutely. And you grew, Absolutely. You grew up in a time of, of really revolutionary filmmaking, too, so that doesn't hurt anything either yep. to um, grab the wonder yep. of the young mind. But uh, it's really amazing that you were actually so responsible to run a theater production for as long as you did. I mean, you were, what, 15 when you said you first started? Uh, <laughs> that's got to be difficult. It's like herding cats at that age. So I can really imagine uh, the kind of you know, dedication you had, it, your craft you had. It, it really wasn't. And I'll tell you why. Because because I never had a moment. Thought I was trained by this this amazing uh, theater director, this guy named Al Pia, who, who's who's passed uh, several years ago. Um, and Al was a Broadway director and a brilliant actor himself. And he taught me at 11 years old, um, he, he would sit with me and we would go through the book and actor prepares, Stanislavski's an actor prepares. And we would, um, he would go through chapter by chapter with me until I understood it. So by the time I was 11, I was doing college age work as far as the kind of reading I was doing and the kind of comprehension I was getting. And that was all led by this brilliant, sensitive, wonderful mentor who um, who took me under his wing. And so, and I was taught very early on, even in school, you know, we are not amateurs. We are not doing this um, just to have fun. We always had a good time. It was mm -hmm. always fun. But it was, if you're going to do it, be a professional. Be a professional from the beginning. And so for me, even on my sets, um, my sets are really fun. My sets are a little bit of a party. Uh, but the party is all about everybody getting together, working together, and getting the film accomplished. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and that's really, that's very theater-like. That's, that's very much sort of um, the training of working as a troupe and that everybody is responsible for the project. I do not believe in the auteur theory. I think the auteur tour theory is bullshit, <laughs> even though I was, I was trained at NYU where the auteur, auteur theory is king. Um, you know, Citizen Kane was not made by one man. It's just bullshit. And, and there are film scholars who love to play that game. And there's so much research to, 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 the, to that not being the case. There are directors with a much, you know, with a strong sense of style or a very, very strong signature on a film. But it, any of them to, to say that the movie is entirely theirs, they're a fool and a liar. Um, unless you are, you know, in a basement, uh, making an animated movie on your own <laughs> mm -hmm. and you do all the voices, you do all the camera work, you do all the drawing, you do everything. Um, no, you're not, you are, you are not the only person, you're not the only author of that film. Um, and I find it, I find it somewhat reprehensible that, that there's anyone who actually believes that nonsense. So I am about teamwork. I'm about, um, everyone getting credit where credit is due. And I'm about telling a story together. It's it, it's kind of the only way it works. Mm, yeah, it makes sense to me. I mean, take the team approach on a team project, and and voila, I mean, yeah. things just yeah. happen, you know, and and, and yeah. projects get done. I can only imagine, you know, the butting of heads with everyone trying to hold on so tightly for creative control. It's just yeah. So, uh, so you went to NYU, and uh, yeah. you seem to have gotten the call to come out to to do your own film pretty early. Um, 
were yeah. you actually just kind of putting your name out there in film circles, or was the connection kind of a good thing to have out there, or how did it come well, to be you were called up so young? What happened was I made a movie at NYU called So You Like This Girl, which was a um, romantic comedy, and uh, a really sweet, funny little movie, um, sort of uh, David Mamet meets John Hughes. And uh, so there's a lot of swearing in the movie and a lot, you know, a lot of the way teenagers actually talk, but it has the fun of a John Hughes movie. And uh, what's incredible about the film, you know, it's a tiny little movie, but my buddies at NYU, the guys that I grew up with, uh, you know, Tom Lennon, um, who was Officer Dangle in all the in Reno 911, and also created that show and wrote in the museum, and he's done incredible things. Tom uh, was one of the leads of the film. The other lead of the film was a guy named Bill Latruglio, who, if you ever watch Brooklyn Nine Nine, is the lead of that show. He plays Andy Samberg's uh, partner, um, and he's he's a genius. So um, I had this incredible cast in this little movie, and the film not only won Best Picture at uh at uh at nyu but it also um it won a special prize it was created for the movie which was the ensemble cast award so every actor in my film was awarded for their performance uh we won a special cinematography award i mean we, we just keep getting awards for this movie and again nyu you know you're talking about you're up against 200 other movies so it's very competitive it's the you know it's the best film school in the world um and and uh especially for directors. There are other schools. USC is an incredible mm -hmm. producing school. UCLA is an amazing writing school. But NYU for directors is really considered sort of the creme de la creme. And so I was very blessed. I was very lucky. Again, I had an amazing team and, and great cast. Um, and this film, on all these accolades, we were uh, nominated for the Student Academy Award. We were uh, we won all kinds of um, scholarships and, and, and uh, grants because of the movie. And uh, the film was screened in New York, and it was seen. I got two job offers. One was from uh, David Lynch and Mark Frost for uh, Twin Peaks Season 2 mm -hmm. to come on as a writer. And the other job offer was from my, my old boss, Sean Cunningham, who I worked for as a teenager, um, to come out to L.A. and to, uh, as he said, quote-unquote, uh, be my bitch for a year, and I'll, <laughs> I'll give you your shot. <laughs> to direct mm -hmm. and so i ran to la i mean i just uh, immediately shot out to la and uh that was you know that was kind of the moment where i i look i took the leap i had no money it paid off all my debt but i had no money i literally had 300 dollars in my pocket and no driver's license because i had spent the last four years in new york city you don't need a driver's license so i was a i was a bike messenger in new york but I had also, while I worked in New York, uh, I worked on a ton of movies for a company called R. Greenberg and Associates. And this guy, uh, Bob Greenberg, who was my father's best friend when I was growing up, my, my dad, Wayne, um, Bob Greenberg offered me a job at this company. And what R. Greenberg did was they were um, special effects, titles, design. Um, if you remember, like, the, the, the original Superman movie, the Chris Reeves Superman mm -hmm. movie, the flying title to come out of the screen, they did those. Oh, nice uh, they, won the Academy, they won the Academy Award for the Predator vision in Predator. Um, they, they were, like, this amazing special effects titles house. And so I, I worked at R. Greenberg, and so I got to work on Silence of the Lambs, Goodfellas, Bonfire of the Vanities. I mean, I got to work on all of these incredible movies. Um, with these brilliant filmmakers. So I had already had this wonderful kind of portal into that world, and I was unafraid of all of it. I think mm -hmm. that's the secret to all of it is no one, I never let anybody make me fearful of it. So when I got to LA, no car, no driver's license, 300 bucks in my pocket, and I'm working for slave wages for Sean S. Cunningham, um, it was uncomfortable. I slept in a car mm -hmm. for a long time. Um, but I was like, uh, this, this is my life. This is what I chose and I'm going to make it happen no matter what. Now, were you doing and, like PA and, type work or what kind of, what kind of work were you doing? I was a PA. I was, a PA. I was an assistant slash PA, which basically meant I was, you know, the piss boy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, merci, monsieur. Piss boy. Oh, we miss you. Oui, oui. oui. Yes, a lot of it. Um, Thank you, Elbrook. Uh, literally, I was delivering. I was delivering stuff on a ten-speed bike in L.A., which is a terrifying idea. Okay, sleeping in a car. 
Um, I made 300 bucks a week. Oh, it was a pathetic existence. It was bad. Um, but I had a script from a buddy of mine in college that we had been workshopping for years that I wanted to have as my directorial debut called Johnny Zombie. And that movie, um, I started pitching it. But I let Noel, Sean Cunningham's son, know that I was pitching it. So I got some interest over at Roger Corman's company for the movie. And the minute Sean heard that through my best friend Noel, Sean immediately wanted to see the script because he was not going to allow Roger Corman to snooker something out from under him. And Sean read the script, said, okay, I hate this script. I love the title. So I'm going to give you a million and a half dollars. You go shoot it in Connecticut. Swear to God. I was 21 at the time. You were the chosen one. I mean, and I, I, I was like, really? And he said, but one thing, I hate this screenplay. I want to fire the writer and bring on a real writer. And I went, no, then I won't sell it to you. <laughs> and again, only a 21 year old with no fear, something that stupid. Like, I'm giving you the keys to the kingdom, but you have to do this one thing. And I'm like, absolutely not. But now, uh, you did have an advantage yeah. there, you might not realize. Like, you already were destitute. You didn't have anything really to lose. So you could oh, that's true. stick to your guns. Oh, that's so true. You didn't have a whole crew depending on you at that point. <laughs> you could actually yeah. stick to your guns yeah. at that point. Yeah, the, 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 the most dangerous guy in the room is always the guy with nothing left mm -hmm. to lose. It's totally true. Uh, that being said, I said, look, I said, bring my buddy out to LA, put the two of us up in a hotel and we'll write for six weeks. And if after that, you don't like what we come up with, then fire us, hire another writer. Then that's fair. And he did it and he got me out of the car. I got in a hotel. I mean, it was like, I, I was positioning everything so that I could actually have a life. Uh, and I did, I ended up with a life, which was fantastic. Uh, I, I, I stayed in a decent hotel. I was in a holiday inn for a few weeks, rewriting the script with my buddy Dean. And uh, we ended up with a script that Sean loved so much that we ended up selling it to Disney. And it became a much bigger movie. Suddenly, I was never going to direct it. It was an $8 million film for Disney. Uh, but it was my first associate producer credit. So I went back to Sean. I said, look, I just set you up the movie. We're, you know, we killed it. It's great. I'm 22 years old at the time. I said, you owe me a movie. Like, I, I want something to direct right now. Of war. Seems fair. And uh, and he said at that he said Adam he says the best thing I can say about you the biggest compliment I can give you is the world's biggest nudge. And I was like yes I am give me a movie. Uh, and he said okay well here here's the thing uh, New Line is going to buy the rights to Friday Thirteenth from Paramount. So if you can figure out a way to get that fucking hockey mask out of the movie I'll let you write and direct it. And I went, done, sold. And of course, I, you know, I'm like, get the hockey mask. How the hell am I getting the hockey mask out of the movie? So three days later, I brought Sean a treatment for what would end up becoming Jason Goes Hell. At the time, it was actually called Friday 13th, Heart of Darkness, mm -hmm. the original title, um, because it all revolved around Jason's evil heart. And uh, so that was the that was the original title. I, I gave that to him three days later, and he hired me. Done. I was off and running to make this movie. Um, and at 23, I shot the film, and to this day, I'm the youngest writer director ever hired by a major studio for a, you know for a franchise of that size. So it was uh, kind of a cool thing. And I mean, it seems like a good idea. I mean, uh, you know, strike while the iron's hot. So yeah, keep pressure. Give me a movie right now. My name is known somewhat for at least 15 minutes. So <laughs> you got to do it now. You know, don't wait. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, yeah. And the other film went on. To, uh, they made it as his. He called my boyfriend back. So that's that was the that was my first official movie that I worked on as a, as a producer, um, and then uh, Jason Tell is really my second film. All right, so um, tell us about your very first day on a pro movie set. I mean, when you're in charge, you're the man in charge. You're the one making most of the calls. We'll forget about production and all that. But um, what was it like? Was it? I know you said you're not really intimidating, but when the very first day, I mean, do you just go in there yeah. and and act like nothing's bothering you and internalize any kind of anxiety, or, or how did it go? Yeah. No, what 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 happened? Actually, the first day was terrifying for a couple of reasons. One, um, uh, I, I hired everybody. I had a beard. I had a beard and mustache, which has been sort of my signature most of my adult life. Uh, but we were shooting in. Uh, july and august in los angeles 
So hot doesn't describe it. It's, <laughs> it's intense heat. So I was like, I, I will never survive if I have a beard in this heat. So I shaved, I shaved all of it off. And I walk, in, I walk on the set, and my cinematographer, Bill Dill, who is a beautiful, amazing, brilliant man, um, Bill looks at me dead in the face and goes, and this is in front of the cast and crew, and goes, how the fuck old are you? <laughs> are you kidding? Like, like oh, no. Walking here all Opie style, oh, yep, yep. Seriously, and I, and I have a baby face. Even now, when I shave this off, it's, it's a little ridiculous. <laughs> I, uh, so, you know, there I am, babyface uh, McGee, and uh, I also had written up my shot list for the day, and nobody had checked my shot list, I'm just walking on set, I'm a professional director, I'm going to bring my shot list. So my shot list had, I think it was 48 shots on the first day, um, because that's what I was used to shooting when I would make my little movies. The uh, first AD, like, almost had a heart attack, handed it to Sean Cunningham, who went, Adam. You can't even get half of this. Mm -hmm. Like, what are you thinking? 20 shots. Pick your 20 favorite shots. That's what we're doing. Uh, okay. So, cut to, I'm sitting with the lunch tables they put out on a lawn in front of the first set that we were, we were at. And I am carving down my 48 list down to, I think I, I, I cut it down to like 23 shots, 24 shots, like that. And they said, well, you're probably going to get four of these, but let's see. We ended up shooting 30 shots that day, okay? I ended up inspiring the crew enough to get the 30 shots. Here's what's incredible about Jason Goes to Hell. My average day was 39 shots. That's my average day on that film. Whoa. Um, when everybody said I couldn't get 20. Um, because here's the thing. I don't work the way most people do. And I come from a point of view of... I don't ever want to see anyone sitting around bored. A film set is the most boring place in the world to be. Not my sets. My sets are constant activity. Everybody has something to do. Everybody is excited. Everybody is working because they want to be there, not because it's a job. It's too easy to make everything a job. I don't want to make it a job. I want to be artistic and fun. I want everybody to have a great time and feel like they are painting on the canvas too. So suddenly... This crew that I was told I'd never get more than 25 shots a day wouldn't happen. My average was 39 shots a day. That's the truth. I have, and I have the paperwork to prove it. Well, that should make production companies happy. You know, I mean, you're going to come in under time that uh, way, right? So, <laughs> I, I actually, every film I've made has come in under time, under budget, every single film. I mean, I, I think of worse uh, feathers to have in your hat, you know? <laughs> there you go. There you go. I know, um, well, who was it? Jonathan Frakes, uh, the guy from Star Trek Next Generation, uh, sure. Will Riker. He's sure. real known for uh, real fast production, or, you know, real fast sets, too. Yeah. Like they call yeah. it Two Takes Frakes, so it's like in and out. Yeah. Now, with the Friday 13th movie, that's kind of an effects movie, so that's kind of, that's difficult to get that much going on, so. Oh, yeah. And by the way, we had at least one effect and one stunt working on every single day of production. So, the good news is, look, Sean Cunningham is a fabulous producer. He understands how to build a, a, a show. Mm -hmm. And so I had on that show, including my three days of additional photography, I ended up with, I think it was 37 days of production. It's still to this day, the healthiest schedule I've ever had. It's an amazing schedule. 37 days to shoot a movie. Like I, I wish I could have that on anything else I do. It was awesome. Um, and that's because of Sean and the movie was super low. I had two and a half million dollars to make the movie. Are you ready to pay? I had no money. Um, and I'm all over Los Angeles, and we're in LA. It's and it was non-union movie. It was you know SAG and Writers Guild. Mm -hmm. It was not union film. To shoot a non-union movie in LA in 37 days and never have unions shut you down. <laughs> it's unheard of. And that's purely Sean Cunningham because he is really good at what he does. He is. He's not a great guy, but he's really good at what he does. <laughs> well, you know, you don't have to be liked. I'm sure Rockefeller wasn't the nicest guy in the world too, to people who did his yes. bidding. But yeah, yeah, absolutely. But the, the truth is, I also work with people like my current co my current producing partner is a guy named Brian Sexton, who is truly one of my best friends of my life and the most um, supportive, compassionate producer I've ever had on set. So. You can have, you can do both. You can be a nice guy and do the work, 
Or you can be a dick and do the work. Look, as long as you do the work, I kind of don't care. Like, whatever. I can deal with the person being a dick. It's when somebody doesn't want to do the work. Look, I hate I hate when you get a nice guy who can't do the work. That's the worst. Yeah, yeah. Because you can't even yell at them. You feel bad if you're pissed. But for me, um, no, Sean is, uh, Sean is a brilliant, brilliant line producer. He really is. He knows what he's doing. So as a, as a newer filmmaker, we'll get into the, the movie here shortly and other stuff, but um, sure, sure. What, did you have a trademark? What were you known for? Did you have like a really active camera? I mean, was it you uh, helping direct actors really well? What was, is there any one thing you were yeah. really known for when you first were getting started? Yes, yes the acting. Um, what happened with, uh, look, because I had won all these awards as, as an actor and for my, my performances in my films in New York, um, that was sort of what I was known for. And I even the way I cast the movie... Um, I wanted people who had had either a rich Broadway background or had done a tremendous amount of television or film that um, that was of a certain quality. I, I, I wanted actors that really, really got how to do what they were doing. And I mean, I had an amazing cast on Jace Goes to Hell. Um, what I then did with them was what I would do with any theater company was I said, look, guys, there's no money in the budget for rehearsals, but I'm telling you, if you want to rehearse, I'm available. And I want to do rehearsals. So I will schedule rehearsals. If you can be there with me, fantastic. Uh, almost every actor showed up to rehearse for days. We worked for four weeks before the movie. Now, to re for a director to rehearse his actors on a Friday the 13th movie before the shoot, <laughs> it doesn't happen. Yeah. It just does not happen. So um, I'm very, very proud of the performances on Friday the 13th, quite frankly. I'm really proud of all the performances in my movies in my life. It, it is the thing that I'm more known for than anything else because I'm an actor's director. I love my actors. And, and the other thing is, look, I went to NYU at a time when, you know, the Michael Bay thing hadn't happened yet. Um, when every movie wasn't directed by a uh, music video director. Mm -hmm. When it wasn't, a, like now, I think directors actually think all they're supposed to be is visual artists. That is part of the job, without a doubt. But the far more important job for, for a director is working with the cast. That's who's telling your story. So, yes, do you have to ha know your lenses? Do you have to know your framing? All of that? Absolutely. But here's the thing. I bring on a partner to work with me in the form of a cinematographer to craft those shots. So I know what my framing is, I usually storyboard everything, and so you know what, 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 I'm, what I'm trying to grab. Um, and you have to tell the story visually. That being said, I don't have a partner when it comes to working with the actors. That's me. That's all me. And so I don't ask anybody to rehearse my actors. I don't expect anybody to, to tell them anything on my sets. Um, I, I, that is my purview. And so um, my work with my actors and, and performance has always been the thing that I'm most in love with and the thing that I, that I enjoy crafting the most. Makes sense to me. I mean, that, that, those kind of uh, nuances do come through in a film, you know. I mean, especially if, if, if you've yeah. done all that rehearsing beforehand. So it's like once you get on set, it's almost a natural progression. It's like, oh, I, I did this two weeks ago. Here's where I'm going to be. Here's where I'm going to be. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. Makes sense to me, but no, yep. I guess not everyone thinks like that. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a preparatory no, contingency no, kind of guy. No, but, no, no, no. Yeah. And a lot of times people put it off to the fact that they don't have the time or they don't have the money for the rehearsals. Mm -hmm. But uh, for me, it's like I, I don't want to make a movie that I can't rehearse. Uh, on my my latest film on Secret Santa, um, we we rehearsed uh, we rehearsed again for a month before the movie happened. But more importantly, every morning because we shot at nights. The, the whole film was shot in 11 nights one day. And so we would wake up at about 1.30 in the afternoon, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. We'd all have breakfast together, and we'd be seated around this big breakfast table, the whole cast and I. And uh, we would rehearse the day's work sitting at breakfast. And then everybody would get up, go to hair and makeup, get freshened up, blah, blah, blah. Come back to set, run it once on set, bring cameras up, ready to go. And it's the... It's the only way you can shoot a movie in 11 days. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, that is an impossibility with a cast of 25 people and 13 people in almost every single scene. So to cover that much material, to cover that many actors, everybody has to be on their A game the whole time. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense, too, and this this goes back to what you were saying earlier, too, about maximizing time so you can get those shots in. Are you taking an activity Absolutely. like that 
obviously gets wasted for 30 minutes. Okay, people sitting out staring at each other, talking in, or just eating breakfast. Make it functional uh-huh. time. I mean, you're technically on the clock, right, everybody? Yep. So <laughs> do some work while you're eating. So, um, And it's fun, too, because you're all laughing and, and having a good time with the script. It's a well-written script. You're having a good time. Um, so suddenly breakfast is a little bit of a party in and of itself, even though you're working. Hey, hey. You're preaching the choir here. That's my kind of team building. So yeah. um, when you were uh, tasked to direct uh, Jason Goes to Hell, were you in competition with any other directors, or was it just yours by default? I actually found out later that the that I only had one piece of competition. I actually had a couple pieces of competition that I wasn't talk, told about until later. Uh, but uh, New Line actually was talking to Peter Jackson as well. So it was me and Peter Jackson, um, which I was kept in the dark about at the beginning. And uh, I got the job. So I don't, Had um, he done Dead Alive by then? I yeah. forget what year he did that. but He had just done Dead Alive. And in fact, we were all brought to a screening of Dead Alive. Mm. Uh, and it had not been released in the U.S. It, was, it had only been released in Australia and uh, New Zealand. But uh, they, we, wa- we watched that alive, and I was blown away. I was like, oh, my God, I fucking love this guy. <laughs> I actually think that that movie freaked New Line out a little bit. Yeah, it was pretty uh, intense. I think the executives got a little freaked out by him. So uh, that might have contributed to me getting the job. So I'm not sure. Who'd have know that uh, he would progress to where he progressed to <laughs> later on? But there you go. Exactly. That's pretty august exactly. company to be uh, and c- competing against. He, yes, it was. It was. So, okay, so uh, you were also one of the writers on the film as well. Now, sure did was. you start out as just being the writer and then progress into being the director, or was it all just kind no. of given at once? Like, I, you no, need to do everything here. Writing and directing all mm-hmm. in one. Writing and directing in one because I had given up the directing reins of what ended up becoming my boyfriend's back. So Sean gave me, in turn, gave me the project to, to, to do uh, Jason Goes to Hell. Oh, right. So yeah, it was, it was always that. However, I did have to shoot a director's test for New Line. Um, I also had to, there was an oral exam, I swear to God, at New Line. Uh, Bob Shea gave me kind of a, a quiz in his office uh, about horror movies. So it, was, it was kind of amazing because he had seen my, my, my film that had won all the awards, which was a comedy. Mm-hmm. It was not a horror film. And so he was like, what does this kid know about horror? And luckily, I have a didactic memory for everything to do with movies, but horror movies in, in specific. And uh, I, I finished my test with him, which I didn't even know was a test, but it was. And he turns to Sean Cunningham and, go, Cunningham and goes, well, he doesn't suck, quote unquote. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Glowing I left the room with Mike DeLuca. I, I seriously, I, I left the room with Mike DeLuca, who was who was one of my two executives, Mark Rodescu, my executives. Mike walks out of the room, looks at me. I was like, I was like, uh, he doesn't suck. And Mike was like, you don't understand. That's a rave. It doesn't suck. I'm like, okay, cool. I'll take it. Great. So next thing you knew, they let me shoot a director's test. I shot a director's test. I brought it in, and they loved it. And they were like, yeah, this is our guy. Well, like I said, praise from Caesar, so who's going to turn that down? Yeah, um, whatever. All good. I'll take it. So, okay, so by the time you're handed the reins to uh, the next Friday 13th film, uh, the series is very entrenched as far as lore goes, as far as characters go, as far as what people expect when they go to the theater. Uh, and you were tasked, and you kind of went in your own direction to kind of change things up a little bit. Now, sure. Did you receive any pushback from the studios about this? Because I know they know they have a winning formula None. usually, and uh, but nope, they just let you run None. with it, huh? They they loved it. They loved the they loved the script. They loved the project. They saw the first three days of dailies were blown away, and then they left me alone. I swear to God, three days in, they the studio went, "You got it. We love it. Great. Keep keep bringing good stuff." It's a trap. Um, here's the thing. The only piece of lore. That was in that Friday Thirteenth was entrenched in was a fucking hockey mask that was started in part three. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, there was no other lore. A guy named Jason and a hockey mask. That's it. And what was frustrating for me as a fan of the Friday Thirteenth franchise, which I adore this franchise, adore it. Here was the problem. Okay. Part one is a movie about a woman who is in so much agony over the death of her uh, of her special needs child that she is murdering campers thirty years after that event. Okay, just to keep this camp closed. Her child died thirty years ago. At the end of the film, 
after her decapitation, that child rises from Crystal Lake. Unchanged, except he's got some schmutz schmutz mm -hmm. on him. He's just like covered in some growth from the from the pond. So here he is, this kid who lives in a lake, if you want to take him as a real being, right? Who still looks like a 13-year-old hydrocephalic head little boy. Okay? Attacks Alice, drags her down. Great. We cut to a few weeks later, weeks later, to Friday 13th Part 2. That little boy has grown two, two feet, has gained well over 100 pounds, has found clothes that fit him, has figured out how to use yellow pages to figure out where Alice lives, has then figured out how to drive a car, taken his mother's head with him, gotten into Alice's house without ever anybody finding out that he got into the house, so he's a master cat burglar as well. He hides her head in the fridge, kills Alice, right? Then takes Alice's body and his mom's head back to Camp Crystal Lake, where he's got a shrine built to his mama in a cabin. Okay? That's just movie one to movie two. What's the lore this thing is entrenched in? Here's what happened. Sean Cunningham did not want to make movies about Jason. He didn't. He wanted to make movies about Friday the 13th, about the day, mm -hmm. about bad things that happen on a Friday the 13th. The same way that John Carpenter did not want to make movies about Michael Myers. John Carpenter wanted to make movies about Tales of Halloween. That's what he wanted to do. The studio went, are you out of your mind? There's a killer. We, we have Jaws. And remember, 1975 changed the whole movie business. When Jaws happened, nobody said, hey, this movie did great. Let's go make a different story. They went, no, put another shark in the water, slap a two on the title, done. And they did that. And it would make money because what our business turned into in the 80s was this corporate generated money machine. And anything that had a brand like Coca-Cola, that works. That's how we make money. So here's the thing. They, because there were some, because there was raindrops at the end of Friday 13th, there are raindrops that hit the, the, the surface of Camp Crystal Lake at the very, when he says, what about the boy? What about the boy? Okay. There, there are raindrops that hit the lake. The executives thought they looked like air bubbles coming up from the lake. So they said, the kid in the lake is the killer. That's the next movie. Swear to God. Then Sean Cunningham goes, they put a sack on his head. And Sean goes, what is this, the fucking elephant man? <laughs> man poor Joseph Merrick. Yeah. Okay. So he hates, he, hates the, he hates the sack, right? Hates that they're making a movie about Jason. And by the way, does not direct part two, does not produce part two. He, he has nothing to do with yeah, part Steve two Meyer. except that yeah. his, wife, his wife is one of the editors, who, Susan Cunningham, who's a brilliant editor who taught me how to edit when I was a child. Um, and his protege, Steve Miner, is the guy directing the movie. Okay? Then part three comes. Great. So now we got this guy. Right? Who, once again, his head is completely changed. It's a different head on, on the character. And he finds a hockey mask in the summer in a barn. What? I mean, what? Okay. Now it's the hockey mask. Great. Let's go with the hockey mask. They kill him at the end of part three. Part four. He's still there. Still alive. Now he's got the hockey mask. Now that's the thing. Great. By the way, part four, one of the best films this year. Two is amazing. Four is amazing. Right? Mm -hmm. And not only kill Jason at the end of four, but Corey Feldman turns his, his, that guy's head into hamburger meat. <laughs> There's no skull left. There's no head left. If that kid kept chopping him up with that machete, nothing is left. So what happens? Paramount goes, we made a great movie. Part four makes more money than any of the previous films. It's a huge hit. They go, uh, we'll have a guy pretend to be Jason. <laughs> Poor Roy. Yep. Right. By the, way, by the way, I love part mm -hmm. five. I love part five. You know why? Part five, because... Um, the director came from porn. Uh, there is a there's a dirt under the fingernails about the movie that's so good that especially for a mid eighties movie, it's like it's raunchy and 
dirty and it's great. Big breasts. It's a great movie, okay? However, from a mythological standpoint, Roy has a picture of Jason in his wallet. <laughs> that's how he knows to prestheticize himself. Yeah, that's uh... right, right. And by the way, the guy I think he went to Tom Savini's makeup school because he has absolutely perfected the cow. Mm. It's an extraordinary piece of makeup work. I mean, poor Roy. If he, he he took a wrong turn in Albuquerque, if he just gone to L.A., he could have had an incredible career. So now you got Roy the killer, right? I, staying with the mythology of how everybody gets so upset about the mythology of these movies. Then we jump to part six. Part six, by the way, finally lets Tommy actually be a, a full character because in part five, he's not really a fully realized character. He's sort of bits and pieces of ideas, but it's not a full flesh mm -hmm. thing. Part six, they get a great actor. They create this fantastic set piece. And by the way, part six is my absolute favorite of the entire franchise. Always has been. Yeah, um, I actually interviewed uh, Tom McLaughlin a few months ago on that one, so yeah. Tom, is, he's an awesome yeah. dude. He's a great guy um, with a great sense of humor, a real understanding of, of storytelling. But here's the thing. Now you've got the Frankensteinian version of a zombie story because a uh, thing got hit by lightning mm -hmm. and made his heart beat. And not only that, but his head is pretty intact, even though when young Tommy chopped him up, he chopped him up, but there's still a head on the guy. So, so how did the head regenerate? So, okay, part six, you got, you got zombie Jason now. Part seven, he fights uh, Carrie mm -hmm. because they are literally out of ideas. So, like, uh, he's got to fight somebody. We can't just keep having him cut up teenagers. What the hell is that going to be? Um, oh, I know. Carrie is in the woods. <laughs> so now it's, it's Jason versus Carrie. And then part eight, they go, well... All right, we don't have any. We, Paramount doesn't own any other characters to throw at this guy, so I know what we can do. We're going to put the baddest killer in the world up against the baddest city of the world. Jason takes Manhattan. Great idea. I could not have been more excited. Except, Jason does not take it. Take Manhattan. Jason takes boat ride for an hour of the film. <laughs> He lands in Toronto, right? Yeah. Montreal, in Montreal. <laughs> yeah. and and then spends about you know a minute and a half in Times Square, and then gets dissolved into baby Jason in the sewers because we have all of that toxic waste in the New York sewer system. It's all the rage. Everybody knows about the toxic waste. No, here's the thing: the toxic waste is back in Jersey, <laughs> where the whole thing started. <laughs> We don't have any toxic waste in Manhattan. So we have toxic people, but not waste. So that's what I'm handed. Now, here's the thing. What's the mythology? The only consistency from part from for halfway through part three to part eight is a hockey mask. That's it. Everything else is up for grabs. They keep changing it in every movie. And my feeling was, as a fan of this franchise, I went, okay. I get a chance to actually create a mythology for this character who I'm tired of being told he's this little boy from the lake who is bullied. Now he's getting the bullies and he's going to get him by chopping him up. Oh, stop it. Like, give me a fucking story that I can listen to that actually has some meat on the bones. So I immediately thought, all right, I'm going to start connecting this and create my own horror universe. Because when I was a kid, and I don't know if you ever experienced this, but when I was a kid, you know, when Batman was on Scooby Doo, that was the coolest thing I had ever seen in my my little child eyes. It was eyes. amazing crossover. And then, right, and then the Harlem Globetrotters were on Scooby Doo, and I was like, my mind was blown. And I'm like, wait a second, all these guys live in the same thing? That's amazing. So. I started to say, great, I want to start bringing mythologies from other films into the Friday 13th franchise. Um, by the way, that was not dictated by New Line. New Line didn't ask me to put Freddy in the movie. They did not. That was 100% me. And New Line went, you want to do what? Yes, please. That's how that went. But 
when I met Bob Kurtzman, the K of K and B effects, my effects guy for the last 25 years, who I adore. Um, when I, and by the way, he was the second unit director on Jason Goes to Hell. Um, Bob became one of my best friends, like instantly. We were just, we're, we are brothers from completely different mothers. And, Bob and I had such like a, a love affair with each other that he started bringing me to sets with him when he would be doing other movies prior to Jason mm-hmm. Goes to Hell so we could just talk shop, right? So I went to out to the set way out in the fucking desert uh, for uh, Army of Darkness uh, for, for Sam Raimi. And that's when I got to meet Sam and hang out. And remember, e- Evil Dead, uh, my, I, I got a videotape in New York City when Evil Dead came out because we couldn't get into the theaters in New York to see it. I got, a, I got a VHS tape, brought it back to Connecticut, and we played it in my friend Dan Lowenstein's basement. I was 13. And we all watched The Evil Dead, and I was like, oh, my God. This is movie making. Like, this is a bunch of college kids who had no fucking money to make a movie, and they went out and made a fucking movie. And not only make a movie, they made a badass, scary, awesome movie, right? The acting, mm, but the rest of it, just incredible, Right. And so meeting Sam, for me, was like meeting God. So there I am on, on, on a set of, of Army of Darkness. They let me puppeteer a bunch of deadites on set. It was amazing, right? So I have this incredible, like, experience. And I said to Bob, I said, look, is there any way that Sam would let me use the Necronomicon in Jason Goes to Hell? And he's like, why? And I tell him my plan. And I say, look, say, this mythology makes no fucking sense. But one thing could fix it all. It could make all the rest of the mythology for all the other films make sense. What if Pamela, in her need to have her baby boy back with her, has tried all kinds of witchcrafts and spells and anything she can do to bring her son back? And what she does is she reads from the Necronomicon. And Jason is brought back that way. Well, now Jason is this instrument of, of, of the devil, is this instrument of darkness, is a deadite in, a, in whatever form that we want to we specify through the Book of the Dead. And now, oh well, yeah, Jason can regenerate. Jason can be a zombie. Jason can fight girls with telekinesis. He do all this shit. Now there is a be-all, end-all of Jason gets away with murder. Done. And thus the retcon is born. <clears throat> It, but it wasn't a, wait, but it wasn't a retcon. But it's not really a retcon because what it does is it actually makes the first movie make sense because you know, this, th- this little boy living in a lake for 30 years, I buy it. I buy it. His body has been resurrected by his mother. It is still a little boy at the bottom of a lake. Got it. Then that boy growing to two feet and gaining 120 pounds in a couple of weeks, I buy it. It's the evil dead. <laughs> So when you suddenly apply those rules to all the other movies, not retconning at all, but simply saying, what is it that let him do all of this shit in these movies? His head gets pulverized to hamburger meat in part four. Bury the body. Underneath the earth, that head comes back full form. I buy it. Now I buy it. Because that guy has been touched by a magic so evil that it can raise the dead. So suddenly, it's not a retcon. It's actually taking the movies of my childhood and giving them a spine that now makes some, from the universe standpoint, sense. Also, it's why I've got the dagger. I'm I'm literally using all of the props from the evil Mm -hmm. dead to destroy Jason. So I'm, all I'm doing is infusing a second mythology to make the mythology of, of, of the Friday 13th franchise make sense. Um, then, of course, you know, the Freddy Glove is simply that, you know, Jason was being dragged to hell. Well, who better to drag him to hell than the guy who just went there and Freddy's dead? Freddy Krueger himself. <laughs> and my whole concept behind both of those killers is that they're hell's assassins. So they will both run in hell. That's the fun. And that was actually the opening of Freddy versus Jason when I was writing, when I was pitching New Line uh, right after mm-hmm. the film. So, well, yeah, in hell. So, all right, so we got some uh, changes to the mythology a little bit and the characters a little bit. 
Uh, now, as far as casting, uh, were you kind of an active participant in casting for these roles, or did you leave that to you know the casting director and all that? No, hundred. No, no, hundred percent. The casting director. I had great casting directors. I had uh, David Moss. Um, I'm sorry, uh, Barry Moss and David Giella. Um, Barry Moss uh, was a Broadway casting director. He worked with Sean for many years. He's a, a, a gene. He was a genius. He's no longer with us. Um, he he cast the Cosby Show as well, the entire series. And if you remember, remember that kid Peter on the Cosby Show it was Rudy's mm -hmm. best friend, a uh, little kid who didn't talk. Well, there's an episode where Peter's dad comes to pick him up, and Peter's dad is also kind of a short, heavy set little guy who doesn't talk. That's actually my cast director. That's Barry Moss. Um, Barry was uh, adorable, and he had a, a, a partner in L.A., a guy named Dave Giella, who's a wonderful cast director, a wonderful guy. Um, the two of them brought me the best actors you could possibly imagine, and just, just so many incredible people. Um, and I read every single one of them. I, 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 as a director, I don't even allow the first auditions to happen without me in the room. Um, I, I, again, I, my, my love for actors is, is sort of my signature. And, uh, and so I was there for, for every one of the pieces of casting. Interesting. Now, and speaking of um, characters playing roles here, uh, Kane had played Jason in the previous yeah. two uh, iterations. Mm -hmm. And was he the default pick for Jason in this movie, or was it still like an open was casting? Every, no, no, no. There was never, no, 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 no. There was never any other person uh, thought of talked about cast for it, nothing um kane uh i wanted kane from day one sean wanted kane from day one uh, i was like is there another jason i i, I don't want to i don't even want to talk to a different jason at that point um and honestly his work in both films was fantastic but his work in part seven and the look of of uh <laughs> the look of of jason in part seven is so badass and it's a lot of where we based a lot of the look for jason goes to hell's look was on part seven so um the, I, I think all the guys that came be uh, uh bob howard and, and greg all agreed on on sort of uh, buchler's design was uh was seminal um and, and better than anything that happened before or, or since uh and so we were like yeah we're 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 gonna push on that but no, Kane Hodder, not only was Kane absolutely going to be Jason, but I wanted him to be in the movie as Kane. Jason could be getting up and walking around anytime soon. <laughs> we really nailed that fucker. I wanted to have a joke where, mm -hmm. you know, where Jason killed Kane, um, which is in the film. <laughs> also, uh, Kane, well, Kane was the stunt coordinator from day one. So um, even in writing the script, I would bounce stuff off Kane to make sure that, that he knew how he wanted to do it and, and that we could do it. And um, so no, Kane was a partner in, in the movie. He's Kane's, I, I, I love Kane. Kane's is amazing. He's an amazing man. He's a great artist. And uh, it, he, he just is Jason. And, and quite frankly, what they did to him on Freddy vs. Jason is so despicable um, and unnecessary and didn't make the movie better by any means, quite frankly. Um, you know, Kane is, uh, he's a guy who takes that part as seriously as Meryl Streep takes one of her roles. So I, I find it so heavily disrespectful when, um, when people don't want to, they don't want to honor the fact that Kane is, uh, you know, he's the Olivier of uh, Jason Voorhees. Just this. Yeah, I, I uh, interviewed C.J. Graham a few months ago as well, and I, I talked to him a little huh? bit about that situation right. with Fre Jason or uh, Freddy versus Jason. Yeah, and it was it was it was interesting their approach to things. You know, I mean, is it just a height thing? Mm -hmm. Put him in some boots. You know, he can he can you can that's literally creative what I angles. I mean, <laughs> so, but right. Well, you know, it's funny. I I always love when people when when there are fans who come at me because because I blow up Jason and because I got rid of the hockey mask. I love when fans come at me and I go, you know, guys, you're really you know, I'm. I'm really on your side. Like, I am a fan of these movies. Talk to Ronnie Yu about his fandom. He flat out said he didn't even watch any of those movies. He didn't even watch the, the, the Jason mm -hmm. films. He had no interest. Um, and I'm sorry, what's your problem? Um, uh, the hockey mask is really the thing you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna die on that hill? Um, because there's those of us who actually are trying to make a movie for the fans. And then there's those of us who don't give a shit about the fans, um, and they care about height difference. It's, it's, uh, I, I've never, I never understood that choice. Terrible. Yeah, sometimes you, uh, you, you know, you maybe letting the studios dictate too much to how your film should be going. I don't know, but, uh, yeah, it just, it seems well, like a travesty. No, that wasn't, but that wasn't the studio. That was 100% mm -hmm. the director. 
Um, uh, it really was. And it's uh, the, the student, remember, New Line's the same place that made my movie mm -hmm. and that supported Kane and then made Jason X and supported Kane. And look, even for those who hate Jason X, Kane is so good in Jason X. Like, he gives this wonderful performance in that movie. So you go, great, even if you don't like the movie, he's great in it. Yeah. So how do you not support that? Why, you know, because Robert Englund's face is, is more visible, um, they had no choice but to cast Robert, and, and as they should. I mean, Robert, Robert is Freddy Krueger. But to not cast Kane um, seems so incredibly disrespectful, not just to Kane, but to the fans of the franchise. Yeah. And, and okay. for those watching, I'm not throwing uh, casting shade at Ken Kersinger or anything like that. I'm just saying the decision for oh, not yeah. hiring Kane was so arbitrary and strange that that's, that was what that yeah. the big deal was. And by the way, by the way, the, the, the other actors that have played Jason have done a fine job. It's not, it's not taking away from what they've done. Those actors aren't wrong, complicit in any mm -hmm. way. They just took, they just took a job. Actors want to work. Um, it, this is now about filmmakers and about um, being responsible to the, to the fan base. And, you know, while I might have blown Jason up, I brought him back, um, and he was getting hotter. So I still made a Jason movie with a hockey mask with me <laughs> in the movie, even though I was told to get rid of the damn hockey mask. So. Uh, talk about paying a little bit of fan service there, whether they liked it or not, right? So um, That's right. Uh, I'm, that I'm is about right. the studio, not the, not the fans. Um, so speaking of actors, uh, your character, Creighton Duke, uh, the bounty hunter in, um, in yes. the movie, was paid by Stephen Williams. Now, uh, from what I gather, he was like basically competing with Tony Todd for the part. Now, I am a... No. No, he wasn't? Okay. Well, IMD let me, yeah. let me wrong yeah. again, but that was, uh, that was kind of... No, 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 no. no that, Tony Todd came in mm -hmm. for it, absolutely. Um, what happened was the original actor was a Broadway actor, and he was white. Mm-hmm. The original actor was, um, I'm not going to go too far into this because it's going to be covered a lot in the documentary. Um, but that actor uh, was pulled from the picture uh, only weeks before we went to cameras. And uh, so we, so, so uh, Barry Moss came to me and said, hey, how do you feel about going African-American with Roll? Um, and I said, yeah, that sounds badass. I'd love it. Um, I said it's a little reimagining of what we had originally written, but I think it's kind of cool. Let's let's do it. I'd I'd I'd, I'd like it to be sort of uh, you know uh, this more kind of cool guy um, and give it a, a, a slightly different beat. Uh, but the backstory still worked that, that we had created for mm -hmm. the character. So they brought in a bunch of actors, um, including Yafet Kodo was read mm -hmm. for it, um, who's brilliant, including Tony Todd. Uh, the day I met Stephen Williams, the decision was made. It wasn't even, it, it wasn't even a close call. Um, Stephen was, he walked in the room, he did the work, he and I talked for about 20 minutes, and I was just like, you are Creighton Duke. It's, it, it's, not, it's not like you're an actor who walked in and gave me a great mm -hmm. performance. Like, everything about Stephen was Creighton. Finish him. Um, he's got a sense of humor that is unfucking believable. <laughs> Jason Voorhees. Well, that makes me think of a little girl in a pink dress sticking a hot dog through a donut. Like, he is so funny, but he's funny without trying to be funny. Like, he just has this way that is so damn funny. And look, for me, I, I, you know, I still teach acting. I'm still, I still have run my own studio space in, in LA. And one of the first things I teach my actors is that guys do not ever give a performance where you don't bring your sense of humor to the performance. The people we love, the stars we love to watch, all of them are funny. All of them. And I'm talking about guys who do comedies. Gene Hackman is funny in every movie he's in. Because Gene Hackman always brings his sense of humor. And we don't think of Gene Hackman as like he's a comedian. No, that's not the way, that's not his career. But if you watch even Unforgiven, he is hilarious in that movie. You laugh a lot at Gene Hackman. Oh, that look like real hard cases, Bob. 
Did you kill all seven of them dead? Or did you just wing some of them? Even though you're not thinking of it as a comedy. And for me, sense of humor is everything to a performance. It's everything to a movie. You have to have, the audience has to be having to some degree a good time. Even if it's a horror film or a heavy drama, there has to be that sense of humor. And Stephen brings that all along. I love that. Sorry, get off on a tangent. I love Unforgiven. I love Little Bill Daggett. And it's funny. It's, it's, it's weird. Oh, he's okay. funny, but you're laughing nervously at him because he's such a intense character. You mean like the duck himself, I guess. <laughs> they, the Duke. Duck, I says. It's, yeah, so yeah. And you feel bad. You actually feel bad laughing with him. Like, am I complicit? Because, I'm, because I find this guy delightful? <laughs> It's the devil, you know? But think about it. Hans Gruber. Mm -hmm. From Die Hard, yeah. There's, there's no funnier character. He's hilarious. I mean, he's really funny, and he is full-on evil. He's petty evil, no less. And we love him because, again, Alan Rickman, I mean, think, about, think about Robin Hood, where Kevin Costner had to cut down Alan Rickman's screen time because he was... Upstaging him, yeah. People thought... The people thought the movie should be called Sheriff of Nottingham, not Robin Hood. That's a problem. But it's because it's such an incredible sense of humor. By the way, I'm a huge Kevin Costner fan as well. He's brilliant. But, but again, it's, it, when somebody is funnier than you, that's dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> that's very dangerous. Because they can become suddenly the lead movie, or at least the person that people want to be watching. So I won't be harping on... Uh, Jason goes to hell all night. Just a few more questions on that, and we'll get into other stuff here. Um, sure. Time permitting, of course. Sure. I didn't know if you had any word you needed to get going. Um, so are you still close with any of the cast or crew from the film? Do you still keep regular contact with any of these people? A ton, a ton of people from the crew. What's amazing is when we went out, when I went out to start getting people to do the documentary based on Jason goes to hell, uh, Hearts of Darkness, the main of the final Friday, when I went out to start grabbing people, what's incredible is how quickly everybody was saying yes and how immediately they took my call and wanted to talk. Uh, Rusty Schwimmer, <coughs> who I adore. Rusty is Rusty is truly one of the greatest actors I've ever worked with. Truly. There's, there's, uh, there's, there's very little comparison, quite frankly. Um, anybody else? She is, oh, she is, she is amazing. Um, she gets me, like, teared up just thinking about her. Um, I called her up. We hadn't talked in years. Within 30 seconds of the phone call, it was as though no time had passed. And it's like I'm talking to my sister. Um, so, there, look, uh, there are cast members who probably curse my name to this day and want, want nothing to do with me, and that's cool, too. That's fine. Uh, but, but for the most part, no, I've, I've kept close. Uh, Stephen Culp and I have been friends since. Um, Jonathan Penner, who actually got cut out of the movie, uh, is a close friend. I adore Jonathan and his wife, Stacey Title, the brilliant uh, film director who um, is suffering from ALS now. Um, and uh, no, I've got, uh, and uh, Stephen Williams and I are working on a couple things together. Um, no, I'm, I'm still close. I'm still close with that, with that cast. There, uh, there are John LeMay and I have been friends for, since then. And, um, and of course my brother Kip and I, you know, who, who's one of the leads of the movie. So, uh, no, I've been very, I've been very lucky when it comes to, uh, the, the, the kind of love. And again, it's because hopefully because of the relationships we created back then were built the way theater relationships are built. Um, you cannot talk to each other for a decade, but when you see each other, all of those good memories from that moment come flooding back and suddenly you're like, Oh my God, it's you, and it's like family member. So yeah, I'm, I'm still close with uh, with my team, and and as I said, Bob Kersman uh, is still to this day the the guy who runs all my makeup stuff for everything I do, all my effects. But also, Bob is directing a film for my company right now. So um, yeah, we're 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 uh, again brothers. All right, so this all this positivity is so great, but uh, the next question might. Stir up a little negativity. I don't mean to do that for shock value or anything, but this is, once again, the legend goes. Uh, yeah. Apparently, according to what some people say, that yourself and Carrie Keegan had some real friction on the set because of a particular scene. I mean, was it as bad as people say? And well, if so, have you guys patched things up since then? Um, it was probably worse than people say. Um, Carrie and I, uh, we were really close prior to shooting. 
during shooting, remember, this was Carrie's first movie, as it was my first movie. We both were making rookie mistakes, um, especially in our relationship with each other. Carrie was hired to do a nude scene in the film. It was part of the script. She agreed to do the nude scene when we cast her. I had another, I actually had another woman I wanted to cast in that role, uh, Lori Holden, who was a good friend at the time. Um, she and I were close. And uh, she was brilliant in her depiction of the character. And Sean Cunningham would not allow me to cast her because, quote-unquote, she's too fucking pretty, quote-unquote. Um, and I was like, wait a minute, when is too pretty bad for the leading lady? What? Um, but I was not allowed to cast her, so uh, I cast my second choice, which was Carrie. Um, and Carrie was a terrific actor. She was, she was really good. Uh, Carrie did not want to do that nude scene. She never told us that. She just didn't want to do it. And there were a lot of choices that she made during production um, to, so that she would have leverage to not have to do that scene. Um, she had a very unscrupulous agent, who I will not name, uh, who was working with her at that time, um, who uh, was assaultive. And uh, quite frankly, I, I could have sued him, and I, I didn't, which was, a, which, you know, was probably a mistake on my part because it would have settled things pretty quickly. Um, but uh, there was a lot of ugliness. Uh, we saw each other probably about, God, uh, we saw each other... 15 years ago when the book for Crystal Lake Memories came out and Carrie and I um, buried the hatchet, so to speak, uh, not Friday the 13th style, which ends up right <laughs> in the middle of your head. Um, but uh, we buried the hatchet with each other and look, Carrie is not an actor anymore. She, um, she does make appearances from time to time, but Carrie, um, Carrie had done stuff on our film that made it tough for her to, to, to jump into other work um, because she done a lot of stuff, a lot of, a lot of stuff, not just to me, um, to production. Um, she, she had caused a lot of problems. Um, and, uh, so Carrie had a beautiful life. She has a, a lovely husband, beautiful children. Um, she made a wonderful life for herself and God bless, man. I'm so thrilled for her. Um, I, I, I have absolutely no ill will towards Carrie. I think Carrie's a lovely woman. Um, I think that she was very young when we cast her. I was very young directing her. Um, and, uh, you know, stuff happened pretty much. Uh, but I don't hold, I, I, I we're, we're adults and you grow up and you kind of go, okay, um, that happened, but you're still a lovely person and you have a lovely family and I, I want you to be well and do well in anything you want to do. And so that's kind of where I came from with it. Um, but yeah, there was, there was definitely, there was definitely friction back then, that is for sure. Well, you know, I mean, who among us? The shame of it... Right, right, mm -hmm. right, exactly. But the shame of it, here's the thing. When you're making a movie, in a high-profile movie, this, the way this movie was, you know, every little bit of gossip people are going to run with, which is fine. Um, in this case, you know, the, the gossip was, you know, based in something that was real. Um, but more importantly, um, you know... You're artists. You're going to have fights. Stuff's going to happen. It's just the way it works. And, uh, and that's okay. That's okay. The shame of it is that the scene that I wanted to shoot with Carrie um, was incredibly tasteful, and it was actually inspired by Glenn Close's um, new scene in The Big Chill. So it's not like I was doing some, like, sudsy, lather-up kind of, you know, bow, to bow, bow. Oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. I wasn't doing that. Um, I have love scene in the movie. It's intense. Uh, it's got the best kill in the series, in my opinion, and in the opinion of a lot of people. Ah! 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 Um, the tent kill, which is epic. Uh, and that love scene, like, yeah, yes. It's, I mean, that's, a, that's intense stuff, and it's some great nudity. So I, I get, look, I was told right at the beginning of writing the script, um, I had to have uh, fresh kill every seven minutes and fresh boobs every seven minutes. Oh, not these. These were real hooters. <laughs> In alternating three and a half minute increments. I kid you not. They had a formula down, didn't that they? That was the rule. <laughs> oh, they sure did. And I kept fucking with their formula because I'm the first Friday 13th movie to have as much male nudity as female mm -hmm. nudity, which drove everyone, drove Sean Cunningham 
so insane. At one point, he's like, God damn it, Marcus, get more tits in this movie. Is this some kind of bust? Well, it's very impressive, yes, but we need to ask you a few questions. And what I did in response was I had Kane in full makeup hold a, a centerfold from a hustler, and we shot a few frames of it so that in dailies the next day, there would just be uh, that image. Sean screamed at everybody involved. It was a joke. It was a joke. And he lost his fucking mind. No sense of humor whatsoever in that. We were like, all right, whatever, dude, whatever. So um, the Carrie thing, I really wanted to give her this like kind of beautiful moment um, that was not exploitive and not what you see in a Friday 13th movie, but she didn't want to do, uh, she didn't want to show her boobs. That's what it was about. She didn't want to show her boobs. So, and I respect that. That's fine. And every, by the way, every actor, uh, according to SAG, you can get to the day of shooting it and then go, no, I don't want to do it. And that's it. We can't force you to do it. Even if you're under contract for it, we can't, we can't do it. So she could have just said no. But instead, it turned into a whole lot of other nonsense so that she never knew. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, we'll so it was bad. We hate to dwell on the negative, right? I mean, <laughs> but, but uh, yeah, I'm sure a lot of people were curious. You know? I, I, I know she's a lovely person and has a great family, and that's awesome. So <clears throat> all good. All good. So we're just about out of uh, Friday territory here. So looking back, you know, uh, Adam Marcus of today, is there anything you would change mm -hmm. about how you approached the movie and how you executed it? Um, the only thing that, that I, look, the only thing that I would have done very differently um, was something that was in the original script that I didn't get to do because we didn't have the kind of money for it and there was no such thing as digital effect back then. Um, I wanted, when each person's body was deteriorating because the evil Jason inside them was so strong, as their body would deteriorate, you would start to see sort of the image of the hockey mask underneath the skin, almost pushing out of the skin. The eyes would become sunken. The, 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 the holes would start to appear where the holes are in the mask. Um, and you would actually start to see the mask pulling through the skin. So it, what it would do is it would actually let people still see the mask consistently throughout the film or more consistently throughout the film. Um, I would spell Voorhees correctly on the fucking mailbox um, where everybody thinks that's a director's job. Like, I go around and I paint the name Voorhees on the mailbox. I, I love the number of people who are, like, furious at me for that. And I'm like, wait a second. Sean Cunningham produced the movie. He's the guy who made the first film. He created this whole fucking thing. And you're pissed at me for the misspelling of Voorhees on a mailbox? Yes. Because that's what a director does. And there was no digital back then. But now everybody thinks because digital fixes everything. Why do you need to fix it digitally? It didn't exist back then. Jackasses. So, yes, I wish I had spelled the goddamn name on the, on the thing correctly. Now, release your anger. Only your hatred can destroy me. Um, that would make my life way fucking easier. Um, and I wish that I had had the balls to really come out a, a little more um, specifically about the Evil Dead stuff so that it wouldn't have been a surprise 25 years later um, where people lose their minds over that too. Um, where I really would have, you know, flat out said, you know, Jason's evil comes from a place not of this mm -hmm. world. Well, um, I, and I thought it was obvious right away when I saw it, but I mean, <laughs> well, not everyone. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. I'm a child of the 80s, so I watched all the Evil Deads and Army Darkness a lot, and so... And you're an astute viewer. There are people who just <coughs> go to the, who go to Jason movies to see a wrestling mm -hmm. movie. They're there to see a Mexican wrestler that happens to wear that mask. That's what they're there for. And that's fine, and I love those guys. Like, that's awesome. Do that. Be involved with that movie. You have six of those. You don't need mine. You have six movies with your wrestler with his hot mask. Go watch those films. Don't watch mine. Get it? So immediately preceding Jason Goes to Hell, you, you kept directing, writing, producing, and all that. But it looks like work might have slowed yep. down a little bit. Was this something that – were you just going in a different direction professionally? I'm, I'm just looking at listings, and it looked like it kind of uh, – sure. was that something that was intentional on your part, or, or was the calls not coming through as much? Uh, what was going on? No, no, no. Here's what happened. What happened was I was given a three-picture deal at New Line. We were negotiating the deal when Ted Turner bought the studio. 
And next thing you know, there was no horror at New Line. He was literally canceling all horror at New Line. So suddenly that deal fell through. I had a deal with Francis Ford Coppola's company, Zoetrope, to do a zombie ninja movie. Um, then Zoetrope went bankrupt again. That was killed. I was then offered every movie that had a part number at the end of it. Um, Pumpkinhead 2, Amityville 97, uh, Leprechaun Back to the Hood. Um, it was like every sequel that I, I've been offered three Leprechaun movies. Um, I was actually offered a scary movie uh, from the Weinsteins from Miramax. Uh, and then a week later, Wes Craven came to the project and said, I want to do this. And I was like, well, I got to go. Bye. Um, so it was a lot of horror stuff and, and it was a scary movie I would have loved because it turned, you know, scream is genius. But um, there were a lot of offers of stuff that for me was not exciting and not interesting. Um, I actually got some friends of mine to do Pumpkinhead too, which was great. Um, and B did it, and my, my cinematographer Bill, Bill shot it. So I was very happy to like push people towards work. But for me, I was like, I don't want to do this. Um, I don't want to. I don't want to be the guy with a part number after every film I make. So uh, I was writing my own original stuff, and during that time, my brother came to me with a play that he had written called uh, Let It Snow. Uh, originally it was called Snow Days. And so I went to New York and I shot an independent film in New York. Uh, it was thrilling and exhausting and exciting and amazing. And uh, that movie was a huge festival hit or a Sundance hit, um, LAIFF, uh, Los Angeles film, uh, International Film Festival for uh, American Film Institute. Um, we were played all over the world. And, uh, and I ended up with this kind of, you know, cr this critical darling that won awards everywhere and got me some of the best reviews of my career. And then I started writing for television and I did a lot of writing at that time. So on IMDb, you don't see the scripts that writers write that they get paid for that don't get made. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I have literally got scripts at every single studio in Los Angeles. Every script, every studio has got out of market scripts in, on the walls. The problem is, is that if you make them, I still got paid for them. You just don't know they happen. So the truth is I've never stopped working since I made Jason Goes to Hell. I just only directed a certain number of films or written a certain number of films that have gotten made. Um, and quite frankly, uh, there, are, there are films I'm incredibly proud of and then the ones I'm not so proud of. You gotta of. pay the bills too, uh, right? So. <laughs> yes, but specifically my Val Kilmer epic, uh, I can live without. Um, but it's... Um, no, I'm actually, I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of the career that I've had. Uh, and a lot of it you don't see. And then there's a lot of script doctoring that I've done that, again, you never see because we just get paid for that. We don't mm -hmm. take credit. Um, so, yeah, so that's, you know, my, my career has been a bit of a journeyman. Um, and in the middle of all my television stuff, suddenly my horror voice kind of got noticed again uh, in a script that was on the blacklist uh, called Black Autumn that sold to uh, 20th Century Fox and is still sitting on a shelf at Fox. Um, and that's when things like Texas Chainsaw 3D came and other stuff that, that, uh, that I wrote. So, um, yeah. So that's kind of where my career You bring up kind of interesting point. And, you know, people think about actors only getting typecast, but I guess it's really easy for, you know, a director to get typecast too. You know, I am the guy who does the low budget <laughs> uh, sequel bait, you know, movies, horror movies. So I guess it would, yep. oh, it yeah. takes a little bit of like self-control to start turning down work, right? It's like, I don't want to be known for this. I want to do something else and nipping it in the bud before it gets to yes. be a problem. I did, not want, I did not want a life of that. I did not want a life that had a part number after everything I made. I didn't want that. Um, and while that life is sometimes less lucrative in the, in the short term, um, the long term advantage of it is you're not that guy. And that guy only has a certain shelf life. And then you've done 10 of those. And then they go, great, thank you. There's a young guy that's going to do those now. And for me, I was like, there were all these stories I wanted to tell that were my stories not somebody else's story, and I got to put a chapter on it, were stories that I wanted to start. So uh, a few years ago, right after Texas Chainsaw, in fact, um, I'd done Texas Chainsaw, and then my wife, Deb, and I had written um, a film called uh, Momentum. It was also a blacklist group called Gravity many years ago. And Momentum ended up, um, uh, we, uh, it was 
Olga Karolinko, James Purefoy, and Morgan Freeman are the leads of that. And uh, after those two movies, I kind of sat back with my wife and, and writing partner, Deborah, and my best friend, Brian, and the, the three of us kind of were like, we, we'd all been working for the studio system. He had been working in a, in a job he hated. Uh, Dev and I had been writing for 20 years for studios. And I just went, no, man, this is for the birds. Like, I, I'm tired of other people coming in on the 11th hour and changing our writing and changing our work. I don't know if you've seen Texas Chainsaw 3D, but... You know, we attached it to the original film. Toby Hooper loved our screenplay. That script got Dev and I paid for four more jobs, four other jobs off of that script because the script was so tight. And when they made the movie, you know, the movie takes place in 1983. And suddenly there's a scene with a smartphone and a cop using a smartphone with a camera. And I'm sitting in the theater going, what the fuck is this? <laughs> Some period piece, what is, huh? This, what is yeah. I'm like, this is nonsense. Here's the thing. And then critics come down on us, and then fans, the series come, and I'm like, wait a second. We didn't write that bullshit. That's not us. No, it wasn't us. It was the director and, his, and, and, and a woman that he had hired to, to do a rewrite on the film, Kristen Elms. Um, and they, had, they, had turned, they had turned the cast into the United Colors of Baton. They had... Uh, put a cell phone into the movie that is so bizarre. A smartphone, even a cell phone, a smartphone. In 1993, um, it was just on and on and on with the anachronisms. And I, I just went, you know what? I'm really tired of handing our work over to people who don't know what the fuck they're doing, and then we get the bad review for it. I don't want to do that anymore. And hence, we created Skeleton Crew which was a home for, for not just for horror filmmakers, but for filmmakers who have been trapped by either, you know, being pigeonholed mm -hmm. in something. And that can include, like, a writer who's always wanted to direct and never gets the chance to direct because everybody knows him as a writer. So we created Skeleton Crew as this place where uh, voice could be heard, new voices, and even older voices that hadn't gotten to be heard yet. And, uh, and that's what Secret Santa was born from, um, which has been incredibly rewarding. And uh, for, for my money, the, the film I am the most proud of. Cool. Not to segue into something else, it was funny because I was talking to Tom McLaughlin, too, uh, about another movie he did, yeah. an earlier movie of his. And he actually cast Adam West because the man couldn't find work. You know, he was typecast so bad that they wouldn't hire him for anything else. So he actually brought the guy in. So Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. This happens all the time. It happens all the time, and, and, and it limits what people are able to do as artists, which is awesome. It is. So, yeah, I was going to say, so I've seen in, over the last five years or so, you seem to have, your, your credits and all that have really jumped up. It's like you've had almost a career resurgence. I mean, do you uh, attribute that to the Texas Chainsaw Massacre script, or what would you say is the new, no, renewed interest? No, I, I attribute that to taking over my mm -hmm. own career and saying I'm not going to allow um, the powers that be to determine what I do and how I tell stories. And suddenly, I'm telling the things I want to tell, and I'm doing it with my own with my own company, and it's been insanely rewarding. Example, like so rewarding. Um, and by the way, including the fact that you know we just uh, you know we we just put together this documentary about my first film, um, which is an independent documentary it has nothing to do with studios that ever did uh, a Friday Thirteen film it has nothing to do with Sean Cunningham. Um, it is truly a documentary about what went down uh, and why the hell anyone would give a 23-year-old film school idiot the car, the car keys to the world's largest, most successful horror franchise of all time. Who would do that? Um, and that's what the doc is about. And that's why I'm doing the doc, because it's sort of warts and all. I didn't want to do a puff piece. I wanted to do something that was radical. Um, and that's what Skeleton Crew does. Skeleton Crew is about edgy, interesting stories. Um, and by the way, that includes, we've got a couple of like, romantic comedies that we're working on that are adorable, um, but that are seen from a different perspective um, or told by a different voice. Um, and that's kind of, you know, that's where, where the resurgence is, is just that I'm, con I'm controlling my own. Again, I don't have scripts that go on a shelf that I don't make. Where I've got 20 scripts around LA that I've been paid handsomely just for. Here collecting dust. That's for yeah. getting made. You're never getting paid, and that's okay. I get it. It's a, hey, man, it's a paycheck. Cool. 
Hey, so I'm a member of the uh, Deborah Voorhees Sheer Horror Group over on Facebook, and I um, actually interviewed her a little while ago. Uh, you two seem to have, like, a great repartee, man. You're both sharing each other's work all the time on the site. Uh, how, how do you guys know each other, and well, why do you all seem to get along so famously uh, on social media? Deb and I get along. Uh, I think it, what happened was I was doing a live event. This is many years ago. I did a Facebook live event uh, for one of the pages. I don't remember which page it was. And Deborah happened to listen to me that night. And I was talking about actors and acting and how I direct and, and my love for actors. And she just loved everything I had to say. She started asking questions. And with, by, by, the end of the, by the end of the Facebook Live, it was literally just Deb and I talking to each other through her messages to me and then me responding and answering questions. And I got to tell you, I just fell madly in love with her. I just think she's an amazing woman. I think she's uh, a really talented. Look, you know, for her to turn the part that she has in part five, not just into a successful career, but to turn it into a successful directing career, to, to veer off into storytelling, um, I, I applaud anyone who can do that. I applaud anyone who can take the moments they've had on film and generate that into something where they're actually getting to do the job they've always wanted. That's, again, what Skeleton Crew is about. So, so Deb sort of is, is – look, I want to tell you something. If someone else hadn't produced 13 Fanboy for Deb, I would have. Um, that's how much I love Deb. Um, so Deborah, not only that, but you know, Deborah then came to me and needed cast for her for for Thirteen Fanboy, and I sent her twenty auditions from twenty of my actors, my troupe from Skeleton Crew. She already hired five of my people to go out there, including my wife Deborah, who went up there to to shoot a few months ago. Um, so no, Deb is. Um, Deb and I both have, a, have really the same spirit um, when it comes to filmmaking, and we're passionate about storytelling, and, um, and she's also just a hell of a person. She's a nice woman, uh, and I'm sorry, the world needs a whole lot more of that. So, you know, and I, I look, I, you know, I've been, um, and the proof is in the pudding, I've always been sort of equal opportunity when it comes to women, especially in my career, um, not just in front of the camera, but behind the camera. Um, the fact that my partner is my wife, and she's always been 50% of my voice. Um, you know, I was raised by a single mother. Um, I'm that guy. So Deborah from typifies everything that's awesome about women who take charge of their careers. And I'm also producing, you know, a film for the Oscar sisters. Um, so I, I've been that guy before it was fashionable to be that guy. Um, and again, you know, I'm the guy who put in as much male nudity in a Friday the 13th movie as, as female nudity. So <laughs> much I've much to some studio heads chagrin, but uh, you <laughs> got to push through, right? Yeah. Don't care. Don't care. Our biggest audience for those movies are women. So I'm like, why are we not showing some dude? And by the way, I'm sorry, a lot of our audience is gay, too. So why are we not showing dudes? Like, what, what, are, we, what are we afraid of here, guys? Um, so again... You know, uh, uh, and Secret Santa follows in this, but so did Texas Chains in our original script. Um, I, I, you know, there are people who my, I'm working on my autobiography, which is called Raised by Wolves. Um, and the, the, the joke is that there are a lot, you know, they, there are a lot of people they say are raised by wolves. I was raised by choreographers. Um, I was raised in New York in the theater. And, and so my films reflect my worldview my worldview has been inclusive since the day I was born. So no one had to tell me to be inclusive. No one had to like guide me to that. That's just who I am. That's just the world I see. Um, black, white, whatever color, quite frankly, whatever gender, gender fluid, gender neutral, it's always been there. So for me, uh, when, I'm, when I'm telling stories, that has always been a part of the fabric of the stories that I tell. And again, Deb is like, she's just so goddamn kick-ass. Deborah Voorhees, my wife Deb, is pretty kick-ass herself. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I, I just, I, I'm going to support any great filmmaker, um, and I'm really going to support the shit out of Deborah Voorhees. Hi, beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'd love to see good it's kind of a mutual big collab. collab right that. She certainly did parlay things into yeah. a, a great uh, career for herself, that's for dang sure. Absolutely. And she does have a great outlook on things. That was a great interview. I loved doing it. But um, I know you're probably getting tired of, of rapping with me. I just got like another question or two, and we can let you get on to your uh, Saturday oh. evening. Um, 
So we touched on it a little bit earlier. you got a big new project going on with the Friday series. It's called Hearts of Darkness. Uh, you kind of touched on what it was. You just want to tell us a little bit more about what it is and who it's for. Um, okay, well, uh, uh, Hearts of Darkness and Making the Final Friday was the, the concept of doing a documentary about, Friday, about Jason Goes to Hell was brought to me a few years ago by a couple of filmmakers um, who really wanted to make the documentary. They just didn't know what the documentary was going to be. Um, and they loved the movie, and they loved me, and that was great, and they were like, we want to do it if you're not involved, and I said, okay, well, I will only be involved if it's worse and all, if it's about the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, I don't want to just make one of those things that you get on a Blu-ray that you go like, oh, it's a 20-minute, everybody uh, says, God, they're good, great, good they're great, and she's yeah. great, and everybody's How revolting. Great. <laughs> right. Where this is a movie that says, there are those relationships, without a doubt. Like there are, I, I adore most people that I that I work with on that film and since. Um, there are also people that I think are the devil, and there are people who don't like me, and there are fans who love my movie. There are fans who fucking hate my movie. I feel the conflict within you. Let go of your hate. And have wished me everything from ass cancer, and that I get raped. I'm, I'm not kidding. These are things that are told to me on a daily basis. By the way. Much anger in them since that movie. Um, there's also this other fandom that's happened that has turned the movie into somewhat of a cult film where there are people who weren't born after the movie started who were not there to watch the mask be born. The mask, um, who, who actually have seen the films either out of order or saw them later, who or some people who just watch my movie first who are like, this movie's fucking great. Like, why were people bad-mouthing this? And there's this whole new fandom happening. And uh, I I've shown the film around the world in screenings in the last couple of years. Uh, we've done a lot of double features with that in Secret Santa. And people lose their minds over the movie. And I'm like, well, where the fuck were you guys 10 years ago <laughs> when I was getting the crap beat out of me on the internet? What the fuck do you think? Um... So it's so the movie is going to cover all of that. Um, so much so uh, in the Indiegogo campaign for the film, uh, because of the documentary and because I'm making it truly for the fans, I was like, you know what? I'm usually not a guy who would go to something like Indiegogo or Kickstarter or any of that, crowdfunding. But I went, you know what? Um, no, this is a documentary that I'm making for the fans. Let's let the fans support the film. Let's let them actually help us make the movie. And it's been kind of incredible because today, literally today, only two hours before you and I started talking, we crossed 100% of our goal on Indiegogo, which is insane. Now we are in demand. <laughs> uh, so I'm very excited to, 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 you are the first person to talk to me since that Breaking happened. it to the world. Um, yep. I literally just a few minutes ago, kind of, we, we crossed 101% and we're, we're just going to keep going. So, um, but it's exciting because I, I'm, I'm going to get a chance to, uh, to tell the story, you know, the way I, the only way that I would want to tell this story. And I'm not directing the film. I'm, I'm the subject of the movie. Uh, I've got a great director named Edward Samuelson, who's a director out of Brooklyn, who's a fantastic documentarian, whose most of his career has been making those 20 little mi minute movies on DVDs and Blu-rays where everybody talks about how much they love each other. And Edwin is so bored of that. I was like, I want to tell the story. I want to get in there. And I was like, I know you do. Let's do that. The other thing is, uh, I got Peter Brackey on this film. And Peter Brackey wrote uh, Crystal Lake Memories, the book. Not the mm -hmm. movie, the book. He just sold the title for the movie and made money. But good for him. Uh, and he, you know, he, is, uh, he knows that over time, his book is now pretty inaccurate. Um, regarding my film specifically because Sean Cunningham is the main voice and Sean threw me under the bus as quickly as he possibly could and suddenly Peter's going wait a second that's not the whole story and he's been researching this so Peter is the historian of the film and doing all of the interviews including mine and I'm not allowed to know my questions until I get them on camera so which I made as part of my deal with Peter I was like I hit me with whatever you want I am not afraid. I will answer what you, want to, what you want to throw at me. Scare the shit out of me, man. Make me as uncomfortable as possible. I'm great with that. If he dies, he dies. 
So I'm the last interview that's going to be done on this movie after they've collected all the footage from all the other people who might have all kinds of horrible shit to say. I'm the last guy. Um, oh, not only that, we have a perk in the campaign. Is what I was trying to get to. Sorry. We have a perk in the campaign um, because I felt like, all right, so there's, there's all these people that hate the movie. Great. But all the people who hate it, they paid to see it in the theater. Then they mm -hmm. bought the VHS. Then they bought the DVD. Then they bought the Blu-ray package from Paramount with the shitty Blu-ray copy of my movie. They've all spent between $50 to $100 on my film. All of them that hate my movie have seen the movie 10 times. They can quote the movie chapter and verse to me, but they hate it. And I went, you know what? Um, huh. How do I get these guys to help me pay for this movie? These guys who hate me. How do they get, how, how can they do that, right? And how do I guarantee that they'll see it? So I created the, you know, there's a thank mm -hmm. you perk that you get thank <laughs> at the end of the movie. Looking at this. And then there is a fuck you perk. And the fuck you perk is so that you can tell me to go fuck myself. You can, you can shout out your hatred. So for 10 bucks, you get to tell me to go fuck myself, and it's going to be on print at the end of the film. You can tell me what this is. Wow. What do you know? And that means you're going to see my documentary. Well, so I talk about tapping an untapped market, you know? <laughs> it's like I'm going to not only, like, yes. cater to my haters, I'm going to embrace them and make them fund this thing, you know? Yes, yes. Be a part of it. I'm again. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid of any of it. I never have been. So bring it. Like bring it on. Tell me to go fuck myself. I don't care. I, there were a couple of guys who were like. There were a couple of guys who wrote something like, uh, "Well, I do hate it. So fuck you, Adam. Look, I just saved myself ten bucks. I was like, well played, well played, sir. Nicely done. But it doesn't. It none of. Look, I'm Teflon at this point, man. Okay. I am. Like, uh huh. Yeah. Oh, no, you don't like that I took your hockey mask away. Uh, I got it. I'm good. I, I got gotcha. you. Yeah, I never understood people getting so, so much vitriol in their, in their... I don't hate any movie, really. Some movies I don't like, and I certainly oh, wait, don't hate the people who make them. But here's you know? the bless them. Bless, bless them for it, because here's the thing, okay? On the night that Jason Goes All came out, I had seen the movie so many times, right? I like, the Two months before mm -hmm. the movie came out. Oh, my God, I was at a screening of night and so i did not want to watch the movie again so what happened was i went to the theater went to my local multiplex in in westwood in in la i bought a ticket for my movie so my movie would get the money and then i walked into searching for bobby fisher right remarkable film written and directed by steve zellian who won the academy award for schindler's list um it uh you know starring joe montagna and sir sir ben kingsley and and uh and joe now it's a beautiful movie i love that film um, I asked people today, have you seen Searching for Bobby Fisher? Beautiful movie. They go, what? No, who's in that? What? I say, have you seen Jason Goes to Hell? Oh, yeah, no, it's not Jason Goes to Hell. Yeah, it's on TV all the time. I watch all the time. Okay, that happened because of people who hate the movie. Not just people who love it, but people who hate it. So it's the most controversial chapter of the series. Great. Bring it. I'm, I'm so cool with that. Have at it. So I, 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 I don't hate anybody for hating the movie. I just don't. <laughs> but like I said, if you're propelled into uh, stardom and work because people hate you, I guess it's not such a bad thing as long as you can deal with it. <laughs> they kept that alive for 26 years. It's great. Great. So what is ahead for Adam Marcus? What's, what's over the horizon? You know, just past Hearts of Darkness. What, what, else, what else is going on here in your world in the near future? A ton. A ton. Uh, we've got a couple of movies that I can't really talk about right now. We've got one really huge film that Skeleton Crew is doing with Lionsgate uh, that has a major, major star attached, uh, but we can't, I, can't, I can't say anything about it. Just yet. You'll be reading about it soon. Uh, we are doing uh, a slate of horror films, one that I'm particularly proud of called Fat Camp Massacre, which is for people of size, what Get Out was for people of color. Um, is uh, it is a real fuck you to body dysmorphia and the and the way that the media uh, and the way that people are seem to still be allowed to make people of size feel like crap about themselves. Um, it is a big middle finger to that whole culture. Uh, we're really excited about that one. I've got my Creighton Duke inspired movie 
Um, it is not a Creighton Duke movie only because I, I can't have a character, but it is inspired by the work that Stephen Williams and I did together all those years ago. So, so I'm working on that right now as well. Um, I've got a brilliant uh, psychological thriller that I'm going to be directing at the beginning of next year uh, called This Perfect Day, which is about uh, a wedding and, um, and some horribleness that, that ensues uh, at that wedding. Uh, Secret Santa is going to be actually released on VOD this week uh, in the U.S., but is just hit Amazon Prime in the U.K., um, and has just gotten uh, distribution in Germany and Australia for this Christmas. So, um, yeah, there's a lot. Skeleton Crew is doing a, a whole lot, uh, not to mention also this documentary. So, it's, uh, yeah, our, our plate is pretty full right now. Pretty oh, it's always good to be busy. I can't stand sitting around doing nothing myself. So. <laughs> yeah, I was going to actually ask a little bit about the uh, the Creighton Duke kind of spinoff movie. I didn't know if you can even talk about it because of all the lawsuit shenanigans going on right now. So, Yeah, I'm not, I, it, here's the thing. It, it's a, it, to call it a Creighton Duke spinoff would just be it's a misnomer. It's really it's inspired mm. by the work that Stephen and I did together. It's inspired by Creighton Duke. Um, it's called Hell's Bells, uh, and it is... Uh, it is a badass. It is Shaft versus the Evil <laughs> Dead, basically. Um, it is fucking badass. With badass. narration by Willie Dynamite. So yeah, who could uh, who who could turn that down, yeah, right? Yeah, there you go. So, Adam, I've I've probably eaten up too much of your uh, Saturday evening, so um, I'm going to go ahead and start wrapping okay. things up. But is there anything else that you wanted to get out there or plug before we uh, head on out? No, no, no. I mean, we're, we're, we're plugging away right now. So it's, uh, you, you've been awesome. And look, all I would say is, you know, follow me on social media. Um, I'm, uh, you know, on Facebook at Adam Marcus, uh, on, uh, Facebook at, uh, at, uh, Mr. Darkness, making it all Friday, uh, uh, at Jason goes to hell, the final fan page, uh, which I'm very proud of that page. That's uh, TJ Bowser who created that for me on my birthday and it's kind of blown up, um, and helped support the doc, which has been amazing. Um, and uh, no, on Instagram, I'm uh, Adam Marcus thirteen at Adam Marcus thirteen. I am uh, Hearts of Dark thirteen on Instagram, on Twitter at uh, Skeleton Crew Pro. And uh, yeah, it's come out and check out what we're doing. I mean, Skeleton Crew is uh, it is it's a throwback company because it's very Robert Corman esque. Um, but it is something where we are really thinking about the future in a big way and thinking about the kinds of movies that people are going to want down the road um, and giving it to people with new voices. So it's, it's, an, exciting, it's an exciting time. Well, uh, great big congratulations on meeting your uh, Kickstarter goal this evening. I uh, just wanted to congratulate you on that. That's no easy task. A lot of those don't ever get fully funded, so uh, kudos Ooh. to there. Uh, I really want to thank you for taking the time uh, today to talk with us and uh, not dodging any questions at all, <laughs> as uncomfortable as they, they might be for some people, you know. Uh, and just and just giving such a great insight on not only your most famous movie but other works that you're doing. So, uh, you know, all of us out here viewing, want to thank you. And uh, unless you had anything further to add, I'll let you get back to your Saturday evening. Thank you, brother. I've, I've actually got a ton of writing. All right, well, I won't keep you from it. So, awesome. All right, so thanks again for watching. Awesome. Uh, stay tuned. Uh, make sure to check out all of Adam's stuff on social media he gave you. I pointed the wrong direction, but there it is. Uh, make sure to check out Hearts of Darkness when it's released. And, uh, you know, support, uh, you know, support your, your Friday the 13th series creators and the uh, people who helm them. So uh, until next time, this is uh, Genome and Adam Marcus. Out. Thanks, bro.